All right, um, thanks so much. Um, we are going to start the panel on responsible practices with generative AI. Um, my name's Hope Schroeder. I'm a PhD student at the MIT Center for Constructive Communication and MIT Media Lab, where I do applied AI research. And I'm happy to host a really exciting panel of some leaders um, in companies pioneering the field of responsible AI. I'll give a qu few quick intros before launching into the questions we have. Um, so Arun Ravindran is the chief data scientist and a partner at BCGX, joining BCG in 2016, where he grew the data science team from 40 people to over 3,000. He's built and deployed machine learning models for over 20 years, including language models for Arabic and Urdu during the Iraq War. He holds patents in deep learning and reinforcement learning and has a PhD from BU. Um, Sydney Montgomery is the CEO and founder of Outline It and executive director and founder of Barrier Breakers. Sydney has dedicated her career to helping students from diverse backgrounds pursue new opportunities and close the equity gap in education. Sydney is a graduate of Princeton University and Harvard Law School. At 29, Sydney is a 2020 IACA Make a Difference awardee. Cap Alpha Theta 35 Under 35 awardee, and she was most recently named one of Women's E! News 21 leaders for the 21st century. Krishna Gade is the founder and CEO of Fiddler AI, an enterprise startup building ML monitoring and explainability solutions to address problems regarding bias in AI. At Facebook, he led the team that built Facebook's explainability feature, Why Am I Seeing This? And he previously held senior engineering leadership roles at Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and Microsoft. At Fiddler, his goal is to enable enterprises across the globe to solve this problem. Thank you all for joining us. So um, we've heard a lot of different issues that touch on potential issues with responsibility in AI. Um, the questions I have for you today were compiled with input from the Generative AI for Constructive Communication course, my lab, the MIT Center for Constructive Communication, and some audience members. I'm going to ask the first one to Krishna. So I'd love to hear the story of how the feature, why am I seeing this, came about at Facebook, and how you realized that explainability matters so much in this field with the mainstreaming of black box models. Yep, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so uh, when, you know, Facebook was implementing machine learning almost all from 2012 onwards you know, to recommend news content and ads. Um, and obviously, with the progress in AI, uh, the complexity of the models increased. And and by the time I was uh, I was there, we were already deploying you know quite sophisticated deep learning models that would you know look into the activity of users and 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 sort of suggest new stories and ads. And one of the things that we didn't have in terms of controls was you know why am I seeing a new story or why is a particular new story going viral and things like that and that's that was important for various different reasons you know from pure play you know engineering debuggability to all the way to like you know executive visibility into how newsfeed worked and uh, that's kind of how we got started so explainability was just taking on so at the time and and we basically implemented this feature that would look into the ranking algorithm and produce you know some high level reasons of why the you know, algorithm was suggesting like um, this particular news feed post to start uh, to show up in the, in, in the user's feed and that's how we got started. Thank you. Um, clearly there is a trust issue um, at stake here that has implications as people try to trust businesses um, with these issues that have machine learning models underpinning them. Arun, I'm curious to hear from you if you think that responsible practices in the financial incentives of businesses in this space are compatible and how you go about thinking about that for your huge team at BCG. Responsible practices and financial compensation, right? Financial incentives. So uh, last year, I think BCG did a study with Sloan, uh, and what we realized is about 84% of organizations agree that responsible AI is something that they want to invest on, but only quarter have like anything in place for anything like ethical or responsible AI. 
So this is still like pre chat GPT, generative AI rush, right? The big gap is more in terms of uh, concept and what happens in practice. I mean, there is still like uh, senior leadership buy-in that's still work in progress. Uh, resource allocation is still work in progress. Uh, how you align this with like specific companies' values is still a work in progress. And uh, that's the reason I say this is still like very much matching those two is, is, is still a work in progress. But several industries are making big progress. I mean, we work with like thousands of companies in this uh, I mean, request in this context, yeah. Thank you. Um, what have you seen in terms of what increases trust um, in this space that you've seen? I mean, trust is tied to capacity overhang, right? The what was called as hallucination earlier in the morning. And uh, hallucination it depends on like, uh, okay, let's talk about um, the unknown unknowns as a scientist, okay? Like as a scientist, I still think there are certain things in generative AI we don't understand. Like if we can talk about uh, the example that Eric Schmidt brought up, which is Kevin Roos's podcast from two weeks ago where um, Bing was telling him he should run away from his wife, right? So there is a lot of things in terms of like how you can uh, pick and prod to understand how the science works. So there is a lot of unknown there. Now put this in the business world, right? I mean, if you're going to deploy this, there is a whole bunch of unknowns in terms of how um, businesses should mandate their own users on how to do it. So when this question comes to us and what we tell is like, look, we need to be clear policy on what your company can and cannot do. There should be a team who is reviewing to say that how these policies evolve with changing technology, science, legal changes. And these policy changes need to percolate down to the organization, but all this need to be capped by what I would call as like a test and learn or a sandbox or a VM environment where like uh, within companies, select employees or maybe the entire company can play with chat GPT or like technology to understand like what is what works, what doesn't work and like have the right type of policies in place. And that is where rubber meets the road. Otherwise, it's going to be like generosity. Everybody agrees that we all need to be generous. Like everybody agrees we need responsible AI, but what happens in practice? Thanks for that. I'm curious if Sydney can comment on what uh, trust issues are in the education space, especially in a found, as a founder in this space. Absolutely. So I come to this work from almost a decade of doing equity work in education, access to higher education, access to student success. And I think when you talk about trust in the education space, you're talking about relationship building. We learned from the pandemic that teachers and educators are indispensable. However, we didn't actually learn from the pandemic how to treat teachers and educators and professors as valuable as they are. And so when you think about the fact that they're still overworked, that the issues that we saw from the pandemic haven't gone away, and then you look at new technologies that come, a lot of times, especially in even the AI writing space or AI education space, they're not being made with teacher input in mind. We're not asking educators, what do you need to make your uh, teaching more effective, to make your workload less, to reduce your burnout, to give you higher quality of life, to help you with your students. We're sort of creating these uh, companies and these technologies in a vacuum and then saying, hey, teachers, I want to sell this to you, or hey, schools, please buy this and use this without having that conversation. And I think that's where the lack of trust really comes from because teachers aren't um, being brought into the conversation, even with ChatGPT and everything that's come out. Um, it, it seems like a conversation that was happening outside of the education education space than then educators just had to react to. So with my own company, with Outline, and we launched in August, we have over 3,000 users, but it, for me, what's most important is that in every stage of the development, we've had teacher focus groups and studies and surveys, and I think more ed tech companies or more companies in general need to partner uh, with their consumers when you talk about trust and really ask them what they need. It's not about what I want to build, really. It's what's going to make the most impact. It's above and beyond education too, right? Any customer consumer interaction with ChatGPT, like it's based on trust. If the same query is, if, I, if you slightly change the query and you're gonna get a different answer and let's say this is like, um, like a CRM system and like we are just talking to a customer relationship management system and if you're gonna get very different answers based on like small changes, that's going to, that doesn't, bro uh, brought confidence and trust, and that is what businesses are based on. So. 
Thanks for that. Yeah, this seems like there's also the issue baked in of communicating about the limitations of the models. And I know, Krishna, you work a lot on explainability, but I'm curious how you think about communicating limitations themselves. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, right, why is trust so important in AI? Uh, you know, I don't know, many of you may have read this famous book called Sapiens. You know, it talks about two things why human as a species succeeded. One is our ability to deal with ambiguous problems. The other one is our ability to scale trust beyond any other animals. You know, we could have a billion people governed by a single individual in a country, or in 100,000 people could attend a soccer game and come out peacefully because we, we basically leveraged trust as an abstraction. So when it comes to human machine trust, the fundamental missing aspect is the transparency. If I actually have a model, you know, generating some text or images, you know, it's all fun and games if it's used for, you know, creative aspects that don't have a lot of costs or risks around it. But imagine if, you know, for example, I'm applying for a job and my resume gets screened by a model that I don't know how it how it works. Or if I'm if my insurance premium is being set by a model behind the scenes or if, if my eligibility for a loan is being determined. In those, as, and, and the stakes can go even higher, in a clinical diagnosis or you know, deploying missiles. You know, when, when you are using AI for those complex cases where humans, humans' life or like, you know, livelihood is at stake, then you want transparency. You want to understand how models work. You know, just like this week, one of the largest HR companies in California got sued for, that you know, by you know, basically that they were biased against you know black you know older uh, applicants. So this is this is basically as AI gets more and more complex, the question for you know transparency and therefore explainability of AI is super important, right? And and that's what we tried we're trying to build at Fiddler, you know, tool that helps organizations to build AI in a responsible manner. But it's it's a hard problem, you know. Yeah. So far, we were able to solve it for you know, traditional machine learning and deep learning models. Now, generative AI, behind the scenes, you know, be, you know, like behind an API, it's even more complex you know, to, 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 to get to like, things like, is the model robust? Is it work, what are the failure scenarios of the model? You know, when will it give you know, answers that are not acceptable? Those are the still like, you know, hard questions for us to you know, really get to the bottom of. Thanks for that. In our pre-chat, relatedly, Arun brought out some really interesting points about how we're at a moment of centralization on the one hand, with a lot of these models developed by companies, and then doc democratization on the other. I'm curious um, if Arun can expound a little bit on the issue of centralization and how it relates to communicating some of the limitations we have. Centralization in the context I was describing is like, these are complex models, large volumes of data. This is not like 20 years ago when we were building like language models, like we had like specific data coming from specific sources here. This we're talking about like petabytes of data and the computing power, not everybody can afford it. There are gonna be like only specific companies who can do it. And guess what? They are gonna decide which issues to focus on when they are solving this whole test and learn sandbox that I was describing earlier. And let's say we all do that, or like there are multiple Kevin Roos's who are working on this, like they are going to list the list of priorities for these companies. How they solve is determined by these companies. So in other words, it's not just the, the computing power and the resources, it's also like how the technology evolves is all determined by these companies. I mean, the usage is democratized. Okay? There, there is like no dispute on that. We, it's, it's all free for us to use. But how do you, um, who courses the journey? Thanks for that. Um, I'm curious to hear from Sydney as a startup founder in this space, how the distribution of power and capital affects you. Absolutely. So I know earlier today, um, Paul Kimura from Microsoft was saying that, you know, it's possible that even small startups will be able to still be disruptors and, you know, the amount of capital that larger companies have won't create a complete shutout. But I think it's important when we talk about this to really talk about the funding gap. I mean, black 
founders, there was a 45% decrease in VC funds that went to black founders just last year. Less than 2% of all VC dollars go to black founders. Less than 1% go to black women founders. So even when you look at my company that is using AI to uh, help writing and student success, when we close our pre-seed round, and we're very close to closing our pre-seed round, I will be one of less than 200 black women to date who has ever raised more than a million dollars in venture capital. That is basically the amount of people in this room right now, which is crazy when you think about it. And so when we talk about the disruption of capital that goes to BIPOC founders, when we have BIPOC founders that are ones that sometimes are most positioned to create AI that has a DEIJ lens or disabled founders who are looking at ways to make uh, AI use for more accessibility features or you know, other marginalized people that are really looking at these ethics, we need to be able to fund those founders so that they can create uh, with that lens because like Arun says, it's the people with the capital, with the data models that will be able to determine the types of issues that they want to most prioritize. So I think we as a society need to really intentionally pour resources into BIPOC founders who are using AI for good and to advance society. Thank you for that. It's critical to draw attention to those important issues. And kind of on that note, um, on the other hand of centralization, we have this theme of democratization. It's easier than ever for people without a coding background to interact with these models in a really exciting way. And I'm curious, Sydney, to follow up on that. What do you see as the most exciting opportunities for democratization, especially in ways that could affect people who are underrepresented or marginalized? Absolutely. So one of the things that is possible, depending on uh, paywalls and access, of course, if we democratize it into the education space, is uh, to use AI to help underserved students. And also just to raise all student success. But specifically, when you look at underserved students in uh, Title I schools or underfunded schools, they don't necessarily have as much access to maybe one-on-one -on -one personalized attention. So just to give like a quick anecdote or example, um, one of the things I'm really interested in is using AI and writing to help create thought partnership with students. So a student at a well-resourced school, they might only have 12 students or 20 students in their class. They might have educated parents at home. They can talk through their essay idea with their teachers, with their parent at home. But a student in an underfunded school, maybe the teacher has 35 students at various different levels. That student doesn't get the benefit of scholarly discourse, which is something that also happens in a liberal arts education. We look at highly selective schools, right? And so that training comes from K-12. If a student doesn't have that access uh, to an educated or a parent at home who can provide that scholarly discourse, then they're not able to um, maybe have as refined an argument and develop those skills. And so thinking about democratizing AI in classrooms in which you can basically have a teacher helper or an additional educator to help raise all students. I mean, right now only 73% of students actually are failing national writing proficiency standards. 89% of black 8th and 12th grade students are failing national writing proficiency standards. So when I think about democratizing access to AI in education, it's changing those numbers, it's changing literacy rates, which is a fundamental skill, so that we can also impact the workplace. Wow, those are striking statistics. Thanks for um, raising those points. I'm curious to hear from Krishna, then Arun, on if you see any potential downsides of the democratization, especially as it relates to putting tools in the hands of people who maybe won't know how all of them work or what the potential risks are of deploying them at scale. Yeah, absolutely. I know. We have been talking about AI governance and responsible AI for the past few years, right? But as Arun was suggesting, you know, less than 20% of organizations claim that they've deployed responsible AI, but it's also not, you know, completely implemented. So now you, you know, the technology with generative AI is advancing so fast that, you know, you almost have to like, you know, really make responsible AI work immediately, right? To make sure that organizations and as a society, we are not you know, uh, not negatively affected by, you know, potential, you know, models going wrong. And we have seen this in many cases, you know, whether in, so you, you know, credit card limits affecting women or, you know, candidates getting rejected or, you know, insurance premiums affecting a certain demographic. I mean, th these are things that are likely to happen even more when, you know, technology that, you know, it's it basically going to democratize or lower the bar to build AI. Because literally, today, you know, today AI gets built by practitioners, like the data scientists and machine learning engineers. Now, with AI as a service, you know, generative AI models with behind APIs, you can have software engineers or application developers 
or people that don't have any background in machine learning could build AI apps. That's amazing. Yeah. But how do we make sure that that those AI apps are built the right way and they're you know working for the customers? So imagine like I'm dealing with a customer support. It tells me that I have actually paid the paid my dues and it gives me a wrong answer. Now now I can actually use that against the company that I basically, you know, this, your AI customer support agent told me that I have paid my, or I have to pay double whatever I have to pay. You know, these are things that kind of affect the customer trust and, and I think that's where we need to work on. I think like, we you know, Kosla said, there are going to be bad apples. There is going to be like yin yang. It, it's for, it's on us to be aware of whether when the bad apples take more media, are we going to focus on them or are we going to see the larger picture? Thank you. Um, to transition a little bit, I um, would like to hear from Sydney to hear about how biases in the technology that you've seen already in deployment um, could affect people that you're trying to build for and help. Absolutely. So one of the things that's important is that AI is only as good as the models that you build it on, right? Um, and so when you think about um, the writing and language space, a lot of times we build the models on a more white Anglo-Saxon, suburban, middle class data set. Um, and so when you think about writing and language, we tend to forget or discount other forms of English um, that are just as valid, like African-American vernacular English or uh, patois or dialogues, even things like uh, Creole versus standard French, right? Like these are very valid modes of communication. Spanglish is definitely very prevalent. But if we are building AI with language models that discount those or say that it's invalid and then deploy that into education, we might be creating a space in which students um, are being told that their voice and their natural way of speaking isn't valid and needs to be corrected and needs to be whitewashed. And that's a very damaging message. And so I think it's really important when we talk about bias in AI, especially even like rubrics or grading, what are the standards that we're using to determine what a good piece of writing is, a good paper is, or it doesn't have to be a paper, or any, any kind of school project. We want to make sure that we are not perpetuating negative stereotypes um, about what is valuable and worthy and what isn't valuable and academic or intelligent, and so I think that's really important in the education space. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. I think what we need to understand is AI is as good as the data that it's going to be fed, right? And today, the society, the world is not in a perfectly equitable situation. So the internet is not a representation of the society as at large. You know, the the most privileged, the wealthiest people have authored most of the content on the internet. And now, if that is the content that's going to feed the models. No, we are going to have it as standardized across the board for future generations. And that's actually uh, you know, something that we need to be aware of. Absolutely. Arun, how do you see this play out um, across the thousands of data science projects you oversee? Yes, the onus is on all of us when it comes to understanding boundary conditions. I think it was Vinod Kosla who was talking about boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions are going to determine our policies. And these policies are not just practitioners. It's not just like me and my data scientist organization. It's like I know people here are from a legal background, from policy background, from so many other backgrounds which have a completely outside in view on like how to define such policies and put in place. And I definitely look up to universities and academia for this personally in this because like if you go 20 years back, open source libraries were defined by universities. Okay, it, uh, we tried like various ways of defining which are the kosher libraries versus not, and it was only after like universities like MIT came in, there was like wider adoption. So I think the onus is on all of us together with a specific push on universities. That actually is a perfect transition. Would love to hear a little bit more about what you think universities should push on specifically. Obviously, we're in a home of some of the leading research um, at MIT on machine learning, but curious to hear um, what specifically you think the university should push for, both in governance research or recommendations, as well as the technical side. Let's start with technical. That's easier for my homeroom, right? So. 
if you think about any of these models under, underlying is differential equations, okay? But we have progressed to a world where like three lines of Python library can build and deploy all these models that nobody actually understands like where these differential equations are going to fail. And trust me, all differential equations by definition have a boundary condition. And that's on the technical front. Like, let's take a step back. Think about the math, okay? And it's not just the four lines library. The library is an approximation of the math, not the other way around. Trust me, when I recruit, there's a lot of students I talk to who believe the math comes after the programming. No, it's like the, program, the math came first, and then you figure out how to implement that in a library. So that's on the technical front. On the policy side um, and the legal side, it is all about like usage and like focusing on like what is fair, like what are the areas where we can get into examples of, uh, we just discussed observation bias, we discussed selection bias, we are gonna run into forecasting bias. So I mean the last, the previous uh, presidential election, I, I felt like we had all three biases, right? That when everybody was predicting Hillary's gonna win, it's like forecasting bias, observation bias, and selection bias, and like we need to be aware of all that. And you don't need to be a practitioner to, to understand these type of biases to kind of check. And the, to end uh, my answer to that, it's, it's I definitely don't think people should shy away from discussing this with like pure technologists, okay? Like understanding how a model is going to be deployed, understanding what's the dotted line to dollar impact, understanding whether this model or is going to perform along expected lines today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. That is for everybody. That is not just the modeling community. It's not just the data scientist problem. And that level of responsibility and like just like challenging, the challenge is free for all. I mean, we can all challenge each other and like for a good duel. So that is for everyone. And academia is the right place for it. Thank you. Um, Sydney, as somebody who's experienced other kind of educational contexts other than the technical departments at MIT, what do you think about um, the potential contributions for sources of higher education on these issues of responsible AI? Yeah, I would love to see um, a, just a greater focus on skill building and using AI to build skills. I think uh, there is this fear that generative AI will make students lazy, that they won't work. I know earlier was mentioned that it might make us less creative. Those are some of the fears. But I actually think that generative AI could be one of the greatest catalysts for making us uh, sharper and pushing us in our thinking and our skill development. Um, and so things like critical thinking skills, uh, but also even practical skills, I think would go a long way towards creating equity in education in general because the cost of higher education is something that continues to be on the rise, continues to be a source of um, conflict and also is one of the biggest barriers to upward mobility. And so if you can, uh, if students are researching ways to um, use generative AI in the development of skills and then perhaps we can create kind of like a another pathway for people to um, enter the workforce, another pathway for people to pivot in their job, right, versus having to go back and get another very expensive master's degree. Perhaps you are able to um, use generative AI to have the kind of skills that you need to re-enter a different workforce. I think that even um, skills that are transferable across different sectors, so I've mentioned critical thinking several times, 73% of employers state that critical thinking is one of the things that they most want from students when they graduate, but, um, least see in their applicants, uh, but other skills, strong communication skills, um, resiliency, uh, there's a lot of skills that I think we haven't really tapped into how to use generative AI for, but if we can, um, those are very transferable for students. Thanks for that. Um, Krishna, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on the role of universities right now compared to industry on these issues. Yeah, so there was this, I think I was talking to you about the Stanford professor giving a lecture on um, natural language processing and, and the LLMs, and the, and jokingly quotes that if you have $50 million, go train in LLM. If you don't, come work on you know, explainability of uh, LLMs and you know, <laughs> faithfulness, um, uh, faithfully ex providing explanations, right? And I think that's actually an open area for research, right? You know. Uh, how do you how do you basically build trust with these large language models or generative AI models is is an open problem. You know how do you figure out the failure scenarios? How do you assess the robustness of the model? You know what are the uncertainty aspects of the model? You know 
how do you uh, come up with like you know quantifiable you know truthfulness you know uh, when is the model bullshitting versus actually saying telling the truth uh, how do you figure out if the model has somehow recorded sensitive data because these models are not necessarily in you know just throwing away the training data they are also recording the training data in ways that could actually come out uh, uh, when a hacker tries to hack into them so how do you uh, you know figure out make sure these models are you know foolproof from a data privacy perspective right you know those are all open problems you know for research community to contribute to and they all actually help us make responsible ai meet generative ai which is i think very very important for us to truly harness the power of ai in a safe and trustworthy manner in the future thanks um one more question about the emerging students coming out of this room probably graduating in a few months curious what you would want them to make sure they know um, about joining this industry right now and the importance of responsible um, development and so on in um, industry startups and also larger companies. What would you tell the students in the room? Absolutely, you know, apply for Fiddler. <laughs> or, uh, so, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it, there are these problems, right? You know, for example, it all comes down to making sure the models are working in a reliable manner, they're not discriminating, you know, that they're tra providing transparency, they're protecting data privacy, right? I think these are all problems that they could work on. There are actually lots of interesting benchmarking data sets that people are creating. You know, there is actually, a, uh, you know, one of the, uh, Truthful QA is a benchmarking data set that, you know, people are trying to create like to, come up with a score of uh, you know whether the model is bullshitting or not so they could you know students can contribute towards that you know there are lots of open source libraries that they could contribute to uh, to advance explainability and model monitoring aspects of these models and they could join companies like fiddler too which are working towards this cause any thoughts on that room uh, welcome to join pcg uh, <laughs> we we are always growing. Uh, like I said, we, we, we started with 40 people seven years ago. We have more than 3,000 now. The one catch, or just to kind of build on that, is when clients come to us, they are asking for a solution to a business problem. It's pricing, revenue, they take a pick, any of the business problems, right? So those business problems, how we build and solve, is predicated on how we can explain. Okay, so this explainability part is like we have to get buy-in from like from the C-suite all the way to the end user who's going to be using whatever like the software we build and deploy, right? So practice the fact how you can explain your models. And this, I have to give a call out to my PhD advisor who always used to say, if you don't know what you're doing, if you can't explain your research to your grandmother, you don't know what you're doing. So that was her bar in the sense, like how I can communicate like computational neuroscience to my grandmother. So that's still a bar. I think I would just add um, the students that are going into the industry to always be asking tough questions about bias and about equity. So often the fact of the matter is that many of the engineers who will graduate from the school do not necessarily come from a marginalized background. But if we have even students that don't come from that asking on behalf of uh, people that are underserved or are marginalized, then we will begin to start seeing in industry changes. It takes, it doesn't have to be a black engineer or a Latinx engineer who is pushing the equity conversation, right? It could be a white middle class cisgendered male engineer who is asking about how does this affect black uh, people or black students? How does this affect those with lower socioeconomic status? How does this affect disability or disabled uh, people? Like those are the questions that I would encourage students to ask no matter where they go and no matter what their own personal background is so that we can start pushing industry conversations. Thanks for those answers. Didn't mean to make this a recruiting pitch, but those were some convincing pitches. We weren't uh, recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks for that. Okay. So um, I wanted to transition to an audience question that I think is um, interesting and related to what we've been discussing um, in terms of trade-offs, um, especially in the business context. So the question is, traceability is key for responsible AI, but how do we balance model transparency and security? How might societal stakeholders approach oversight? Um, so this is a question about whose responsibility oversight is and wondering as some leaders in the field if you have thoughts on that. 
traceability on data and like tracking data that's used in like how you build like for example consumer finance models are stuff that was looked in like even seven years ago okay um, so this is not new in terms of how we can uh, track lineage and also how we can uh, federate some of the data sets to to build specific industry I'm not talking about like the chat GPT level, like large scale LLMs. I'm talking about like AI models that we can build and deploy where like sometimes some certain data can be like, has to be taken out. So this is all work in progress in like, this might not be like public information in terms of how like some of these consumer finance companies might be doing it, but it's, it's, it's happening. Like, so that's a quick response to your question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not just one teams or you know one person's issue right i think most companies that i don't know try to do ai governance would just have some you know mid level low level person you know oversee ai ethics and it's but it's kind of putting lipstick on a pig i think responsible ai needs to be seen as you know a, a way to actually build better ai for your organization for your consumers right i think it's you know that means that the entire organization the data science team the engineering team the compliance team you know everyone need to come together and on, on and actually on the same page and and that and and some of these problems are hard when it comes to complex models you know how do you actually you know figure out what what aspects of the data is affecting the model you know um, how do you you know how do you really make sure that the data sources uh, that you know that are being cited are actually being used in terms of like the generated text or generated image i think these are these are hard problems that one need to work on i mean you know we don't have ready made solutions right now but you know this this is something that needs to be prioritized you know i know we are in this gold rush moment with generative ai but you know this is why you know organizations need also need to invest in these safe practices of building better generative ai models for the society Thanks for that. Yeah, I think that we have an interesting conversation coming up um, regarding copyright, which I'm sure will touch on some of the data provenance issues that affect a lot of the artists we've heard from today and many other fields. Um, as we kind of wrap up here, we've touched on so many heady problems that uh, feel potentially intractable or really hard to solve with these black box models. But Sydney, I want to hear what's keeping you optimistic about the field. Absolutely. Um... I, I tend to be an optimistic person in general, which is a little um, unusual because I'm also a former attorney and I feel like lawyers are <laughs> not optimistic by trade, um, but uh, educators are. Um, and so one of the things that makes me really optimistic is that we're having these conversations, that these conversations are coming down uh, past just an engineering industry level, but really like my piano teacher and I talk about AI, my mom is asking me about AI, um, and, and those are really exciting things for me because I think that means that we're getting to a place where we'll have more voices be heard and more people weighing in, um, maybe even not from a technical background, but from various different lenses um, that are weighing in on how we use AI and how we could use AI to kind of solve some of the social uh, justice issues that we have, um, some of the just social welfare issues that we have. And so for me, um, that's very exciting. When I started Outline, I feel like no one was talking about writing or digital writing tools. And obviously with ChatGPT, everyone is talking about AI writing. And so that's been an interesting space for me to kind of shift into. Um, but I hope that we stay in that space. I hope that, you know, especially from education, we talk a lot about STEM, but I think talking about writing communication at ELA is important. Thanks, Krishna and Arun. I mean, the fact that we are here talking about this, you know, you know, the f full day was all about, you know, exciting part of generative AI. As an engineer, I get excited about the aspects of like what can be built. But the fact that we have actually this session on you know, focusing on responsible practices is great, right? You know, the fact that, you know, civil society and governments have woken up, you know, we have a draft for AI Bill of Rights. We have uh, an IST framework for guidelines around minimizing risk around AI. You know, the, you know there are companies working with tools like Fiddler, you know, with the intention to deploy responsible AI practices. You know, we work with large banks, insurance companies, HR companies. These are all, these give me hope that, you know, there are enough people like us believing in this mission, you know, towards pushing responsible AI and making it, 
you know, you know, operationalized across across the enterprise. I think that's that's what keeps us, you know, excited. The final word with Arun. So we did uh, scouting, you know, BCG. We do a lot of internal projects to understand like what is going to happen with Gen AI. Of course, I can't discuss everything, but I can tell you one thing. Uh, within the first two weeks, uh, we identified close to 100 use cases uh, and business cases that are going to be like transformative in the coming years, weeks, months, years. So I'm super optimistic because I sit in the overlap of like data science and business. So this is going to be um, this is going to be very exciting. Thank you all so much. Um, really appreciate the diverse perspectives that are on this panel. Startup, um, BCG, people in the industry a long time, people from a different background in education. So thank you all so much for contributing your perspective and I hope we can keep this conversation alive because it affects all of us in this room. So round of applause, thank you. Thank you.